But the Lord also says this to the king of Judah, who sent you to ask me about this. Tell him, the Lord God of Israel says, Because you are sorry and have humbled yourself before God when you heard my words against this city and its people, and have ripped your clothing in despair and wept before me, I have heard you, says the Lord. And I will not send the promised evil upon this city and its people until after your death. So they brought back to the king this word from the Lord. Then the king summoned all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the priests and Levites and all the people, great and small, to accompany him to the temple. There the king read the scroll to them, the covenant of God that was found in the temple. As the king stood before them, he made a pledge to the Lord to follow his command so, and to do what was written in the scroll. And he required everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin to subscribe to this pact with God, and all of them did. So Josiah removed all idols from the areas occupied by the Jews and required all of them to worship Jehovah, their God. And throughout the remainder of his lifetime, they continued serving Jehovah, the God of their ancestors. Chapter 35 Then Josiah announced that the Passover would be celebrated on the first day of April in Jerusalem. The Passover lambs were slain that evening. He also re-established the priests in their duties and encouraged them to begin their work at the temple again. He issued this order to the sanctified Levites, the religious teachers in Israel. Since the ark is now, and you don't need to carry it back and forth upon your shoulders, spend your time ministering to the Lord and to his people. Form yourselves into the traditional service corps of your ancestors, as first organized by King David of Israel and by his son Solomon. Each corps will assist particular clans of the people who will bring in their offerings to the temple. Kill the Passover lambs and sanctify yourselves and prepare to assist the people who come. Follow all of the instructions of the Lord through Moses. Then the king contributed 30,000 lambs and young goats for the people's Passover offerings and 3,000 young bulls. The king's officials made willing contributions to the priests and Levites. Hilkiah, Zechariah, and Jehiel, the overseers of the temple, gave the priests 2,600 sheep and goats, and 300 oxen as Passover offerings. Quilaniah, Shemaiah, Nathanael, and his brothers Hashabiah, Jael, and Jozebad gave 5,000 sheep and goats and 500 oxen to the Levites for their Passover offerings. When everything was organized and the priests were standing in their places and the Levites were formed into service corps as the king had instructed, then the Levites killed the Passover lambs and presented the blood to the priests who sprinkled it upon the altar as the Levites removed the skins. They piled up the carcasses for each tribe to present its own burnt offerings to the Lord, as it is written in the Law of Moses. They did the same with the oxen. Then, as directed by the laws of Moses, they roasted the Passover lambs and boiled the holy offerings in pots, kettles, and pans, and hurried them out to the people to eat. Afterwards, they had a meal for themselves and for the priests, for they had been busy from morning till night offering the fat of the bird offerings. The singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their places, following directions issued centuries earlier by King David, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, the king's prophet. The gatekeepers guarded the gates and didn't need to leave their posts of duty, for their meals were brought to them by their Levite brothers. The entire Passover ceremony was completed in that one day. All the burnt offerings were sacrificed upon the altar of the Lord, as Josiah had instructed. Everyone present in Jerusalem took part in the Passover observance, and this was followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread for the next seven days. Never since the time of Samuel the prophet had there been such a Passover. Not one of the kings of Israel could buy with King Josiah in this respect, involving so many of the priests and people from Jerusalem and from all parts of Judah and from over in Israel. This all happened in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah. Afterwards, King Necho of Egypt led his army against the Assyrians at Carchemish on the Euphrates River, and Josiah declared war on him. But King Necho sent ambassadors to Josiah with this message. I don't want to fight with you, O king of Judah. I have come only to fight the king of Assyria. Leave me alone. God has told me to hurry. Don't meddle with God or he will destroy you, for he is with me. But Josiah refused to turn back. Instead, he led his army into the battle at the Valley of Megiddo. He laid aside his royal robes so that the enemy wouldn't recognize him. 
Josiah refused to believe that Nico's message was from God. The enemy archers struck King Josiah with their arrows and fatally wounded exclaimed to his aides, Take me out of the battle. So they lifted him out of his chariot and placed him in his second chariot and brought him back to Jerusalem, where he died. He was buried there in the royal cemetery. And all Judah and Jerusalem, including even Jeremiah the prophet, mourned for him, as did the temple choirs. To this day, they still sing sad songs about his death, for these songs of sorrow were recorded among the official lamentations. The other activities of Josiah and his good deeds and how he followed the laws of the Lord are all written in the annals of the kings of Israel and Judah. Chapter 36 Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, was selected as the new king. He was 23 years old when he began to reign, but lasted only three months. Deposed by the king of Egypt, who demanded an annual tribute from Judah of $250,000. The king of Egypt now appointed Eliakim, the brother of Jehoahaz, as the new king of Judah. Eliakim's name was changed to Jehoiakim. Jehoahaz was taken to Egypt as a prisoner. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. But his reign was an evil one. Finally, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered Jerusalem and took away the king in chains to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took some of the golden bowls and other items from the temple, placing them in his own temple in Babylon. The rest of the deeds of Jehoiakim and all the evil he did are written in the annals of the kings of Judah, and his son Jehoiakim became the new king. Jehoiakim was eight years old, but he lasted only three months and ten days, and it was an evil reign as far as the Lord was concerned. The following spring, he was summoned to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, Many treasures from the temple were taken away to Babylon at that time, and King Nebuchadnezzar appointed Jehoiakim's brother, Zedekiah, as the new king of Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His reign, too, was evil, so far as the Lord was concerned, for he refused to take the counsel of Jeremiah the prophet, who gave him messages from the Lord. He rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, even though he had taken an oath of loyalty. Zedekiah was a hard and stubborn man so far as obeying the Lord God of Israel was concerned, for he refused to follow him. All the important people of the nation, including the high priests, heathen idols of the surrounding nations, thus polluting the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Jehovah, the God of their fathers, sent his prophets again and again to warn them, for he had compassion on his people and on his temple. But the people mocked these messengers of God and despised their words, scoffing at the prophets until the anger of the Lord could no longer be restrained, and there was no longer any remedy. Then the Lord brought the king of Babylon against them and killed their young men, even going after them right into the temple, and had no pity upon them, killing even young girls and old men. The Lord used the king of Babylon to destroy them completely. He also took home with him all the items, great and small, used in the temple, and treasures from both the temple and the palace, and took with him all the royal princes. Then his army burned the temple and broke down Jerusalem, and burned all the palaces, and destroyed all the valuable temple utensils. Those who survived were taken away to Babylon as slaves to the king and his sons, until the kingdom of Persia conquered Babylon. Thus the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah came true, that the land must rest for 70 years to make up for the years when the people refused to observe the Sabbath. But in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to make this proclamation throughout his kingdom, putting it into writing. All the kingdoms of the earth have been given to me by the Lord God of heaven, and he has instructed me to build him a temple in Jerusalem, in the land of Judah, all among you who are the Lord, return to Israel for this task, and the Lord be with you. This also fulfilled the prediction of Jeremiah the prophet. Ezra, chapter 1. During the first year of the reign of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled Jeremiah's prophecy by giving King Cyrus the desire to send this proclamation throughout his empire, 
He also put it into the permanent records of the realm. Cyrus, king of Persia, hereby announces that Jehovah, the God of heaven who gave me my vast empire, has now given me the responsibility of building him a temple in Jerusalem, in the land of Judah. All Jews throughout the kingdom may now return to Jerusalem to rebuild this temple of Jehovah, who is the God of Israel and of Jerusalem. May his blessings rest upon you. Those Jews who do not go should contribute toward the expenses of those who do, and also supply them with clothing, transportation, supplies for the journey, and a free will offering for the temple. Then God gave a great desire to the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and to the priests and Levites, to return to Jerusalem at once to rebuild the temple. And all the Jewish exiles who chose to remain in Persia gave them whatever assistance they could, as well as gifts for the temple. King Cyrus himself donated the gold bowls and other valuable items which King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple at Jerusalem and had his own gods. He instructed Mithridath, the treasurer of Persia, to present these gifts to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. The items Cyrus donated included 1,000 gold trays, 1,000 silver trays, 29 censers, 30 bowls of solid gold, 2,410 silver bowls of various designs, 1,000 miscellaneous items. In all, there were 5,469 gold and silver items turned over to Sheshbazar to take back to Jerusalem. Chapter 2 Here is the list of the Jewish exiles who now returned to Jerusalem and to the other cities of Judah from which their parents had been deported to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Saraiah, Realeah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Figvi, Rahum, Baena. Here is a census of those who returned, listed by subclans. From the subclan of Parash, 2,172. From the subclan of Shephatiah, 372. From the subclan of Arah, 775. From the subclan of Pehath Moab, the descendants of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. From the subclan of Elam, 1,254. From the subclan of Zatu, 945. From the subclan of Zakkai, 7. From the subclan of Bani, 642. From the subclan of Bebai, 623. From the subclan of Asgad, 1,222. From the subclan of Edonicum, 666. From the subclan of Bigbai, 2,056. From the subclan of Aden, 454. From the subclan of Ater, the descendants of Hezekiah, 98. From the subclan of Bizay, 323. From the subclan of Jorah, 112. From the subclan of Hashem, 223. From the subclan of Gibar, 95. From the subclan of Bethlehem, 123. From the subclan of Netopha, 56. From the subclan of Anathoth, from the subclan of Asmaveth, 42. From the subclans of Kiratharim, Cherphira, and Beiroth, 743. From the subclans of Ramah and Geba, 621. From the subclan of Miklas, 122. From the subclans of Bethel and Ai, 223. From the subclan of Nebo, 52. From the subclan of Magbish, 156. From the subclan of Elam, 1,254. From the subclan of Harim, 320. From the subclans of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. From the subclan of Jericho, 345. From the subclan of Sinea, 3,630. Concerning the returning priests, from the families of Judea, of the subclan of Jeshua, 973. From the subclan of Emer, 1,052. From the subclan of Pasher, 1,247 from the subclan of Harim, 1,017. 
Here are the statistics concerning the Levites who returned from the families of Jeshua and Kedmiel of the sub-clan of Odaviah, 74. The choir members from the clan of Asaph, 128. From the descendants of the gatekeepers, the families of Shalom, Ater, Tolem, Akob, Hatita, and Shobai, 139. The following families of the temple assistants were represented. Zaiha, Tabeoth, Kiros, Saiha, Paden, Lebanah, Hagabah, Akub, Hagab, Shalnai, Hanan, Giddel, Gehar, Rea, Reason, Nekoda, Gazim, Uzza, Paseya, Bese, Asna, Meunim, Nephism, Bakbuk, Hakufa, Harher, Basluth, Mehida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tima, Naziah, Hatifa. Those who made the trip also included the descendants of Mishals, Sotai, Hasopherath, Peruda, Jela, Darkon, Giddel, Sephatiah, Hadl, Pocheth Hazarbayim, Amai. The temple assistants and the descendants of Solomon's officers numbered 392. Another group returned to Jerusalem at this time from the Persian cities of Telmiela, Telharsha, Cherub, Adon, and Immer. However, they had lost their genealogies and could not prove that they were really Israelites. This group included the subclans of Delaiah, Tobiah, and Nakoda, a total of 652. Three subclans of priests, Habeya, Hakaz, and Barzillai, he married one of the daughter Gileadite and took her family name, also returned to Jerusalem. But they too had lost their genealogies, so the leaders refused to allow them to continue as priests. They would not even allow them to eat the priest's share of food from the sacrifices until the Urim and Thummim could be consulted to find out from God whether they actually were descendants of priests or not. So a total of 42,360 persons returned to Judah, in addition to 7,337 slaves and 200 choir members, both men and women. They took with them 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Some of the leaders were able to give generously toward the rebuilding of the temple, and each gave as much as he could. The total value of their gifts amounted to three years of gold, $170,000 of silver, and 100 robes for the priests. So the priests and Levites and some of the common people settled in Jerusalem and its nearby villages, and the singers, the gatekeepers, the temple workers, and the rest of the people returned to the other cities of Judah from which they had come. Chapter 3 During the month of September, Everyone who had returned to Judah came to Jerusalem from their homes in the other towns. Then Jeshua, son of Josedach, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his clan, rebuilt the altar of the God of Israel, and sacrificed burnt offerings upon it, as instructed in the laws of Moses, the man of God. The altar was rebuilt on its old site, and was used to morning and evening burnt offerings to the Lord, for the people were fearful of attack. And they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, as prescribed in the laws of Moses, sacrificing the burnt offerings specified for each day of the feast. They also offered the special sacrifices required for the Sabbaths, the new moon celebrations, and the other regular annual feasts of the Lord. Voluntary offerings of the people were also sacrificed. It was on the 15th day of September that the priests began sacrificing the burnt offerings to the Lord. This was before they began building the foundation of the temple. Then they hired masons and carpenters and bought cedar logs from the people of Tyre and Sidon, paying for them with food, wine, and olive oil. The logs were brought down from the Lebanon mountains and floated along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa, for King Cyrus had included his grant. The actual construction of the temple began in June of the second year of their arrival at Jerusalem. The workforce was made up of all those who had returned, and they were under the direction of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Jeshua, son of Josedach, and their fellow priests and the Levites. 
The Levites, who were 20 years old or older, were appointed to supervise the workmen. The supervision of the entire project was given to Jeshua, Cadmiel, Hinnadad, and their sons and relatives, all of whom were Levites. When the builders completed the foundation of the temple, the priests put on their priestly robes and blew their trumpets of ace symbols to preordain nine rounds of praise and thanks to God, singing this song. He is good, and his love and mercy toward Israel will last forever. Then all the people gave a great shout, praising God, because the foundation of the temple had been laid. But many of the priests and Levites and other leaders, the old men who remembered Solomon's beautiful temple, wept aloud, while others were shouting for joy. So the shouting and the weeping mingled together in a loud commotion that could be heard from far away. Chapter 4 Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles had returned and were rebuilding the temple. They approached Zerubbabel and other leaders and suggested, Let us work with you, for we are just as interested in your God as you are. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Esau had and of Assyria brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the other Jewish leaders replied, No! You may have no part in this work. The temple of the God of Israel must be built by the Israelis, just as King Cyrus has commanded. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten them by sending agents to tell lies about them to King Cyrus. This went on during his entire reign and lasted until King Darius took the throne. And afterwards, when King Asuerus began to reign, they wrote him a letter of accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem, and did the same thing during the reign of Artaxerxes. Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabiel and their associates wrote a letter to him in the Aramaic language, and it was translated to him. Others who participated were Governor Rehum, Shimshay, a scribe, several judges, and other local leaders, the Persians, the Babylonians, the men of Iraq, and Susa, and men from several other nations. They had been taken from their own lands by the great and noble Osnapar and relocated in Jerusalem, Samaria, and throughout the neighboring lands west of the Euphrates River. Here is the text of the letter they sent to King Artaxerxes. Sir, greetings from your loyal subjects west of the Euphrates River. Please be informed that the Jews in Babylon are rebuilding this historically rebellious and evil city. They have already rebuilt its walls and have repaired the foundations of the temple. But we wish you to know that if this city is rebuilt, it will be much to your disadvantage, for the Jews will then refuse to pay their taxes to you. Since we are grateful to you as our patron, and we do not want to see you taken advantage of and dishonored in this way, we have decided to send you this information. We suggest that you search the ancient records to discover what a rebellious city this has been in the past. In fact, it was destroyed because of its long history of sedition against the kings and countries who attempted to control it. We wish to declare that if this city is rebuilt and the wall... You might as well forget about this part of your empire beyond the Euphrates, for it will be lost to you. Then the king made this reply to Governor Rehum and Shimshay, the scribe, and to their companions living in Samaria and throughout the area west of the Euphrates River. Gentlemen, greetings. The letter you sent has been translated and read to me. I have ordered a search made of the records, and have indeed found that Jerusalem has, in times past, been a hotbed of insurrection against many kings. In fact, Rebellion and sedition are normal there. I find, moreover, that there have been some very great kings in Jerusalem who have ruled the entire land beyond the Euphrates River and have received vast tribute, custom, and toll. Therefore, I must stop building the temple until I have investigated the matter more thoroughly. Do not delay, for we must not permit the situation to get out of control. When this letter from King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shemshai, they returned to Jerusalem and forced the Jews to stop building. So the work ended until the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. Chapter 5 
But there were prophets in Jerusalem and Judah at that time, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, who brought messages from the God of Israel to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jozadak, encouraging them to begin building again. So they did, and the prophets helped them. But Tetnei, the governor of the lands west of the Euphrates, and Shethabosniians, soon arrived in Jerusalem and demanded, Who gave you permission to rebuild this temple and to finish these walls? They also asked for a list of the names of all the men who were working on the temple. But because the Lord was overseeing the entire situation, our enemies did not force us to stop building, but let us continue, while King Darius looked into the matter and returned his decision. Following is the letter which Governor Tatnei, Shethabosnei, and the other officials sent to King Darius. To King Darius, greetings! We wish to inform you that we went to the construction site of the temple of the great god of Judah. It is being built with huge stones, and timber is being laid in the city walls. The work is going forward with great energy and success. We asked the leaders, who has given us? And we demanded their names so that we could notify you. Their answer was, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth, and we are rebuilding the temple that was constructed here many centuries ago by a great king of Israel. But afterwards, our ancestors angered the God of heaven, and he abandoned them and let King Nebuchadnezzar destroy this temple and exile the people to Babylonia. But they insist that King Cyrus of Babylon, during the first year of his reign, issued a decree that the temple should be rebuilt. And they say King Cyrus returned the gold and silver bowls which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of Babylon. They say these items were delivered into the safekeeping of a man named Sheshbazzar, whom King Cyrus appointed as governor of Judah. The king instructed him to return the bowls to Jerusalem if God be built there as before. So Sheshbazzar came and laid the foundations of the temple at Jerusalem. And the people have been working on it ever since, though it is not yet completed. We request that you search in the Royal Library of Babylon to discover whether King Cyrus ever made such a decree, and then let us know your pleasure in this matter. Chapter 6 So King Darius issued orders that a search be made in the Babylonian archives where documents were stored. Eventually the record was found in the palace at Ecbatana, in the providence of Media. This is what it said. In this first year of the reign of King Cyrus, a decree has been sent out concerning the temple of God at Jerusalem where the Jews offer sacrifices. It is to be rebuilt, and the foundations are... The height will be 90 feet, and the width will be 90 feet. There will be three layers of huge stones in the foundation, topped with a layer of new timber. All expenses will be paid by the king and the gold and silver bowls which were taken from the temple of God by Nebuchadnezzar shall be taken back to Jerusalem and put into the temple as they were before. So King Darius sent this message to the governor Shethar Bosnei and the other officials west of the Euphrates. Do not disturb the construction of the temple. Let it be rebuilt on its former site. And don't molest the governor of Judah and the other leaders in their work. Moreover, I decree that you are to pay the full construction costs without delay for my taxes collected in your territory. Peace in Jerusalem, young bulls, rams and lambs for burnt offering to the God of heaven, and give them wheat, wine, salt and olive oil each day without fail. Then they will be able to offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and to pray for me and my sons. Anyone who attempts to change this message in any way shall have the beams pulled from his house and built into a gallows on which he will be hanged, and his house shall be reduced to a pile of rubble. The God who has chosen the city of Jerusalem will destroy any king and any nation that alters this commandment and destroys this temple. I, Darius, have issued this decree be obeyed with all diligence. Governor Tatnei, Shethar Bosnei, and their companions complied at once with the command of King Darius. So the Jewish leaders continued in their work, and they were greatly encouraged by the preaching of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo. 
The temple was finally finished, as had been commanded by God, and decreed by Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, the kings of Persia. The completion date was February 18th in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. The temple was then dedicated with great joy by the priests, the Levites, and all the people. During the dedication celebration, 100 young bulls, 200 rams, and 400 lambs were sacrificed, and 12 male goats were presented as a sin offering for the 12 tribes. Then the priests and Levites were divided into their various service corps to do the work of God as instructed in the law of Moses. The Passover was celebrated on the first day of April, for by that time, many of the priests and Levites had consecrated themselves. And some of the heathen people who had been relocated in Judah turned from their immoral customs and joined the Israelis in worshiping the Lord God. They, with the entire nation, ate the Passover feast and celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. There was great joy throughout the land because the Lord had caused the king of Assyria to be generous to Israel and to assist in the construction of the temple. Chapter 7 Here is the genealogy of Ezra, who traveled from Babylon to Jerusalem during the reign of King Asha. Ezra was the son of Sariah. Sariah was the son of Azariah. Azariah was the son of Hilkiah. Hilkiah was the son of Shalom. Shalom was the son of Zadok. Zadok was the son of Ahitub. Ahitub was the son of Amariah. Amariah was the son of Meraeth. Meraeth was the son of Zerahiah. Zerahiah was the son of Ozai. Ozai was the son of Buckai. Buckai was the son of Abishua. Abishua was the son of Phinehas. Phinehas was the son of Eleazar. Eleazar was the son of Aaron, the chief priest. As a Jewish religious leader, Ezra was well versed in Jehovah's laws, which Moses had known. He asked to be allowed to return to Jerusalem, and the king granted his request, for the Lord his God was blessing him. Many ordinary people, as well as priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple workers traveled with him. They left Babylon in the middle of March, in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, and arrived at Jerusalem in the month of August, for the Lord gave them a good trip. This was because Ezra had determined to study and obey the laws of the Lord and to become a Bible teacher, teaching those laws to the people of Israel. King Artaxerxes presented this letter to Ezra, the priest, the student of God's commands. From Artaxerxes, the king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, the teacher of the laws of the God of heaven, I decree that any Jew in my realm, including the priests and Levites, may return to Jerusalem with you. I hereby instruct you to take a copy of God's laws to Judah and Jerusalem and to send back a report of the religious progress being made there. We also commission you to take with you to Jerusalem the silver and gold which we are presenting as an offering to the God of Israel. Moreover, you are to collect voluntary temple offerings of silver and gold from the Jews and their priests in all of the provinces of Babylon. These funds are to be used primarily for the purchase of oxen, rams, lambs, grain offerings, and drink offerings, all of which will be offered upon the altar of your temple when you arrive in Jerusalem. The money that is left over may be used in whatever way you and your brothers feel is the will of your God. And take with you the gold bowls and other items we are giving you for the temple of your God at Jerusalem. I'm short of money for the construction of the temple or for any similar needs, you may requisition funds from the royal treasury. I, Artaxerxes the king, send this decree to all the treasurers in the provinces west of the Euphrates River. You are to give Ezra whatever he requests of you, for he is a priest and teacher of the laws of the God of heaven. Up to $200,000 in silver, 1,225 bushels of wheat, 990 gallons of wine, any amount of salt, and whatever else the God of heaven demands for his temple. For why should we risk God's wrath against the king and his sons? I also decree that no priest, Levite, choir member, gatekeeper, temple attendant, or other worker in the temple shall be required of any kind. And you, Ezra, are to use the wisdom God has given you to select and appoint judges and other officials to govern all the people west of the Euphrates River. 
If they are not familiar with the laws of your God, you are to teach them. Anyone refusing to obey the law of your God and the law of the king shall be punished immediately by death, banishment, confiscation of goods, or imprisonment. Well, praise the Lord God of our ancestors, who made the king want to beautify the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, and praise God for demonstrating such loving kindness to me by honoring me before the king and his council of seven and before all of his mighty princes. I was given great status because the Lord my... And I persuaded some of the leaders of Israel to return with me to Jerusalem. Chapter 8 These are the names and genealogies of the leaders who accompanied me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. From the clan of Phinehas, Gershom. From the clan of Ithamar, Daniel. From the sub-clan of David of the clan of Shechaniah, Hattush. From the clan of Perosh, Zechariah, and 150 other men. From the clan of Pehath Moab, Elohoenai, son of Zerahiah, and 200 other men. From the clan of Shechaniah, the son of Jehaziel, and 300 other men. From the clan of Aden, Ebed, son of Jonathan, and 50 other men. From Jeshea, son of Ethaliah, and 70 other men. From the clan of Shephatiah, Zebediah, son of Michael, and 80 other men. From the clan of Joab, Obadiah, son of Jehio, and 218 other men. From the clan of Benai, Shelomith, son of Josephiah, and 160 other men. From the clan of Bebai, Zechariah, son of Bebai, and 28 other men. From the clan of Asgad, Jehanan, son of Hakatan, and 110 other men. From the clan of Adonikam, Eliphalet, Jeuel, Shemaiah, and 60 other men. They arrived at a later time. From the clan of Uthai, Zakur, and 70 other men. We assembled at the Yehava River and camped there for three days while I went over the lists of the people and the priests who had arrived. And I found that not one Levite had volunteered. So, so I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jerib, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, the Levite leaders. I also sent for Joirib and Elnathan, who were very wise men. I sent them to Iddo, the leader of the Jews at Casiphia, to ask him and his brothers and the temple attendants to send us priests for the temple of God at Jerusalem. And God was good. He sent us an outstanding man named Sherebiah, 18 of his sons and brothers. He was a very astute man and a descendant of Marli, the son of Levi and grandson of Israel. God also sent Hashabiah and Jeshiah, the son of Merari, with 20 of his sons and brothers and 220 temple attendants. The temple attendants were assistants to the Levites, a job classification of temple employees first instituted by King David. These 220 men were all listed by name. Then I declared a fast while we were at the Ahava River so that we would humble ourselves before our God, and we prayed that he would give us a good journey and protect us, our children, and our goods as we traveled. For I was ashamed to ask the and cavalry to accompany us and protect us from the enemies along the way. After all, we had told the king that our God would protect all those who worshipped him and that disaster could come only to those who had forsaken him. So we fasted and begged God to take care of us, and he did. I appointed twelve leaders of the priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten other priests to be in charge of transporting the silver, gold, the golden bowls, and the other items which the king and his council and the leaders and people of Israel had presented to the temple of God. I weighed the money as I gave it to them and found it to total $1,300,000 in silver, $200,000 in silver utensils, three mills, and 20 gold bowls worth a total of $5,000. 
There were also two beautiful pieces of brass, which were as precious as gold. I consecrated these men to the Lord, and then consecrated the treasures, the equipment and money and bowls which had been given as free will offerings to the Lord God of our fathers. Guard these treasures well, I told them. Present them without a penny lost to the priests and the Levite leaders and the elders of Israel at Jerusalem, where they are to be placed in the treasury of the temple. So the priests and the Levites accepted the responsibility of taking it to God's temple in Jerusalem. We broke camp at the Yehava River at the end of March and started off to Jerusalem. And God protected us and saved bandits along the way. So at last, we arrived safely at Jerusalem. On the fourth day after our arrival, the silver, gold, and other valuables were weighed in the temple by Merimoth, the son of Uriah the priest, Eleazar, son of Phinehas, Jezebad, son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, son of Ben-Nui, all of whom were Levites. A receipt was given for each item, and the weight of the gold and silver was noted. Then, everyone in our party sacrificed burnt offerings to the God of Israel, twelve oxen for the nation of Israel, ninety-six rams, seventy-seven lambs, and twelve goats as a sin offering. The king's decrees were delivered to his lieutenants and the governances west of the Euphrates River, and of course, they then cooperated in the rebuilding of the temple of God. Chapter 9 But then, the Jewish leaders came to tell me that many of the Jewish people, and even some of the priests and Levites, had taken up the horrible customs of the heathen people who lived in the land, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. The men of Israel had married girls from these heathen nations and had taken them as wives for their sons. So the holy people of God were being polluted by these mixed marriages, and the political leaders were some of the worst offenders. When I heard this, I tore my clothing and pulled hair from my head and beard and sat down utterly. Then many who feared the God of Israel because of this sin of his people came and sat with me until the time of the evening burnt offering. Finally, I stood before the Lord in, in great embarrassment. Then I fell to my knees and lifted my hands to the Lord and cried out, Oh, my God, I am ashamed. I blush to lift up my face to you, for our sins are piled higher than our heads and our guilt is as boundless as the heavens. Our whole history has been one of sin. That is why we and our kings and our priests were slain by the heathen kings. We were captured, robbed, and disgraced just as we are today. But now we have been given a moment of peace. Did a few of us to return to Jerusalem from our exile. You have given us a moment of joy and new life in our slavery. For we were slaves. But in your love and mercy, you did not abandon us to slavery. Instead, you caused the kings of Persia to be favorable to us. They have even given us their assistance in rebuilding the temple of our God and in giving us Jerusalem as a walled city in Judah. And now, O oh God, what can we say after all of this? For once again we have abandoned you and broken your laws. The prophets warned us that the land we would possess was totally defiled by the horrible practices of the people living there. From one end to the other, it is filled with corruption. To let our daughters marry their sons, and not to let our sons marry their daughters, and not to help those nations in any way. You warned us that only if we followed this rule could we become a prosperous nation and forever leave that prosperity to our children as an inheritance. And now, even after our punishment in exile because of our wickedness, and we have been punished far less than we deserved, and even though you have let some of us return, we have broken your commandments again and intermarried with people who do these awful things. Surely your anger will destroy us now until not even this little remnant escapes. 
Oh, Lord God of Israel, you are a just God. What hope can we have if you give us justice as we stand here? Forgiveness. 